He kōna e pūrangi tēnei nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. Hi, Paul here. As usual, this episode has some strong language and descriptions of hunting and accidents. It also has references to suicide. Coming up, poaching is still rife in the industry. You could fly from Haast and be in the back of Omaru on a 500 and catch two or three deer in the back of Omaru and be back in Haast that night. Fueled by skyrocketing deer prices. Everybody wanted deer. There was big demand, the prices went up and up and up. Everyone likes the price rise and that's what happened with the deer. It went from $70 up to 3000 Prices are going up, but so are the accidents. Lots of guys got killed, went to plenty of funerals. If you haven't got luck on your side, you might as well give it away. That was just part of the job, you know. If you got killed, it was hard luck, mate. And your turn, scum. But the live capture period is a cash cow that no one wants to end. And I remember to Mollison, this is not going to last. The government's going to step in here. But as you're here, they're about to have a fight none of them can win. Well, we're at two bob millionaires. And, you know, we thought this is going to last forever. But nothing ever lasts forever. Nothing. I'm Paul Roy, and this is Deer Wars. Episode 9, Don't Dream, It's Over. This is our last episode, and we're back at the top of the Cameron Valley in Mount Aspiring National Park. Pilot Harvey Hutton has been flying me around some of the colour's early hunting grounds, and he's just dropped us off here. So we go around there where it's sheltered. It didn't look like it was blowing here before. That's better here. That's much ah, better. That's better. Now, now we're on it now. <laughs> that's, that's a lot better here. <laughs> it's, chas- it's chasing us around. Must be cold over here, my eyes are watering. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you've heard Harvey chipping in along the way but he's much more than just my pilot. Harvey was born in Darfield outside Christchurch in 1957. His family far from wealthy, and he left school at 15 to seek his fortune, which he has done with many ups and downs along the way. In the chopper world, Harvey's a legend, and he's had a very colorful and adventurous life in the pursuit of deer. Harvey always liked hunting, and somehow managed to score a job as a shooter on a chopper. They were in the hotel there having a drink, and this big tall guy with a beard came in, and like he, was, he would have been six foot six, I suppose. He looked a really big man with a big beard and long hair down to his shoulders, and this big Himalayan jacket on with big puffy sleeves and bell button trousers with embroidery on them. We went over and had a yarn to him, and it was um, Don Andrews. He's, and he'd only just got his licence, and he he was actually looking for a shooter. So I put my hand up for that one. I was probably probably 80, and I may have been younger. For the first time out, like, you know, I could hardly sleep that night thinking about it. I was just, you know, I'm going out for a shot out of a helicopter. But it was very, very exciting and then to head out there, you know, and you just did not want to muck up, you wanted it to work, as, you know, because this is something that you really wanted to do, you know. So, um, you know, the first deer that you see, you, you're shaking like a dog shit and razor blades, but, you know, you line up and you look through the scope, which is like trying to look through a pea. Feel it was a hell of a adrenaline rush. Um, you wouldn't, it was nothing you would ever experience in your life as a young guy. Um, it probably wee bit like going to war, I suppose. Um, but the, the deer weren't shooting back at you. We went out for two or three goes and oh, it was just the most horrendous thing you could ever do. If you've never done it before and you knew you had to try and make the helicopter pay and, and you know, all these deer were running around the clearings and it was just I thought it was just impossible for anyone to do it. 
They weren't easy. But, um, coming into the first clearing and there's four or five deer on it in the back valley in Tiana there. These deer are just scattered everywhere. Well, he's sort of telling you, get that one there, get that one there. Well, you know, can't even, you're trying to look through the scope, you're not actually pointless looking to see where he's, which one you, he wants you to get. We got a couple, two or three deer that morning, but we must have seen 20 or so. And I thought, well, you know, I was going to get the sack straight up. Um, but Don persevered with us, and um, we ended up working together for four or four or so years. Harvey's experience as a first-time shooter is pretty typical, but he's destined for much greater things, as we shall see. Over the course of the venison and live capture era, which spanned roughly 20 years. Over 120 people were killed and hundreds more suffered serious injuries. No matter how good you were, it was a very risky business. And it intrigued me why, money aside, they persisted and how they dealt with it. When there was an accident, something like that happened, well, when there was a funeral, basically, did you ever stop and think because you had two kids and a wife, uh, maybe uh, this is not the game for me, maybe it's time to give up. No, 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 this is not going to happen to me, Paul. This is Dave Richardson. You have met him before, one of the government ground colours. But by now, he is one of the helicopter pilots, right in the thick of things. This is not going to happen to me. It happens to the other people, it's not going to happen to me. We're worried about crashing, why would you start flying? That didn't enter my head at all. Of course, accidents always happen to someone else, until they don't, as Dave Richardson and shooter Alan McDonald are about to find out. And it was an overcast, rainy day. My shooter came round and said, uh, we've still got three hours left on the machine day, why don't we burn it up, you know? Uh, what about a bonus? And, you know, and I said, yeah, yeah, okay. So we went out. You know, I don't know whether you believe in spirits or not, but, but there was something happening that day. When I went across the, the saddle of the McKinnon Pass, someone said to me, turn back, turn back, it's a bad day. And I can still hear that voice, even today. And it was so loud, I said to my shooter, what'd you say? He said, I never said anything. And I thought, hell's teeth. We'll come back to Dave in a bit. But while the men are very well aware of the dangers, after all, it's something they've chosen to do, and they accept the risks. I can't help feeling their families have drawn the short straw. Remember Mark? Mark Cust, who survived a serious chopper crash that killed his friend. He ends up having four more very bad crashes and a bunch of injuries. Yet, he keeps going. No, I never thought about giving up. It was a passion, something I loved doing. I got a little bit anxious at times, but um, I managed to put that aside and just get on with the job and not worry about accidents or near misses. I wasn't going to let something beat me at something I liked doing. But of course, there is another side to the story. Mark's ex-wife Judy gives her take on those times in the very straightforward manner I've come to expect from the partners of these men. We were 15, I think, when we met each other. We were teenagers in Greymouth. We just mucked around with the same crowd. Mark was always a hunter. He's come from a hunting family. And we'd been out hunting. It's part of the courting exercise. You've got to go out hunting and, you know, make a lot of noise in the bush. It's really just an exercise in the bush if anyone thinks that they're going to get a deal with taking a teenage girl along, then they're seriously compromised, aren't they? But anyway, I had a crack at that. I knew what hunting was about. He came back and he told stories that he was hunting me out of a helicopter. I thought they were just shooting deer, but of course it became more than that. We got engaged at 18 and that was before Mark went to ask. I had a job in Greymouth, well, I was about 16, 17 at that time. Yeah, I went down a few times, really liked the place, um, outdoors and everything. Managed to score a full-time job working with the Ministry of Works down there, so off I went. Plonked myself down in the singleman's quarters in Haast and was part of the crew. 
Well, I've been around tramping, so I've been to a lot of the huts out in the back country. So what we actually went down to was pretty much a glorified hut. They were single men's quarters and they were just like tin sheds. One of them had a bit of a kitchen to it, so it was a shared kitchen. But for most of the time, Mark and I were there by ourselves. The helicopter was right next door to it, so at five o'clock or six o'clock in the morning, basically I had a helicopter cranking up right outside my door. It was a pretty isolated place. I've never been a dress wearer to a certain extent, but I certainly knew once I got down to Muscle Point and Haas that I'd probably never ever wear a dress again. There was really hardly any need for shoes. That was gum boots, flies, blood, antlers, and lots of deer heads rolling around with their tongues hanging out. Yeah, pretty different environment, and it was like, pull your sleeves up and get in and be part of it, or you missed out. All the social activities at that time revolved around doing something with deer. It was either gutting them or cleaning them up or transporting them or moving around. So it was all full on, a man's world. There was only one pub in Haast at the time, so um, it was interesting because even though there was competition and rivalry amongst hunting, when you got to the pub, it was all fun and games and everyone had to socialise. You're all in the one room, pretty much. That became a huge part of it, huge culture. It was fun. By now, Harvey Hutton has moved on from being a gun for hire and is a pilot operating successfully through the venison recovery and live capture era. But like everybody else, he's short on flying hours and has pretty basic skills. And of course, the road to being a pilot and surviving is not easy. There was not many instructors in New Zealand in those days, so the Air Force used to come down on the weekends and give us our dual time. And then once we'd been solo, we were allowed to take the machine solo practice during the day and the weekdays. I don't know how we, any of us crashed because you know we weren't that good at it for a while, but we sort of picked up and learned. We were self-taught, uh, a lot of it self-taught. You'd go down to the hotel and you'd listen to the other pilots talking how they'd had frights and what they'd done, and that's how you learnt that this is what happened to him, you know. Of course, there was accidents in those days, and they were well talked about amongst people at the hotel and that, having a drink and discussed and how it all happened. And yes, this era was all very flying by the seat of your pants sort of stuff, with little thought for safety or paperwork? Uh, probably 40% what happens now is compliancy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> In those days, there was no compliancy. No. And there's no, uh, there was no um, fuel was 40 cents a gallon. Um, you could buy a helicopter for 50, 60 grand. Oh, man. Mm. So, you know, it wasn't, wasn't really um, expensive to what it is now. Like, we would fly anything in those days because it didn't really worry us because we, all we wanted to do is get out there and do it. I think I had my first 500 when I was 23 and that was, that was in the heyday of the capture. And um, that were the days we used to buy beer by the tonne and 200 porterhouse steaks at a dollar because we had so much money. Of the, of the price of the deer, because they got up to two and a half, three thousand dollars as a 22 or 23 year old single. Um, there's lots and lots of money. Hearing some of Harvey's stories, it's surprising there weren't more accidents along the way, but they still had their fun. I used to have a few beers all the time, you know, he, he quite liked to drink, and um, we used to go for a shot, and he'd take a half a dozen double brown cans with us. And, uh, He'd be slurping away on these double brown cans, and every time you see a deer, he'd put the can down in the centre and out and shoot the deer. And, it, and uh, quite often he'd pick it up and have another drink, and then he'd hop out and and uh, to hook the animal on. Well, when he got back in, quite often the the can had blown over with the wind going through the cabin or something. Or he used to get all grumpy about it. He reckons I was flying rough and tipping his beer up. The last we heard from pilot Dave Richardson. 
He's flying across McKinnon Pass. When a mysterious voice tells him, turn back, turn back. And we were heading towards the lake, which was all full of stumps, and all the interim panel lit up. It was the engine out, engine out. No, not possible. Everything in an accident like that speeds up. It, terrifically, it speeds up within split seconds of each other. And it was only about three seconds, or less than that. And as we were going down, I was thinking about how I was going to put it on the ground and what gear I had. And I thought, oh, um, my mind went to the fuel in the back of the machine. We had, I don't know, four or five jerry cans of fuel. You know, we're going to have a fire. Fire was a thing that, you know, I dreaded. And then I was looking over at Mac and I said that uh, it's all on. You know, I said to him, it's all on, Mac. Tighten up. In other words, we'd done a lot of practice. We'd done a lot of practice. And that was, if we had a full on and I said it was full on, get rid of the net gun. Just chuck it. Oh, it's only three grand's worth. Chuck it out the door. Get rid of it, you know. Um, get rid of any, any heavy articles, you know, because they'll bounce around and hit you if we hit hard. And I hit the ground very hard. My hands came up in the crash and undid the buckle. All the harness flew off and I went bouncing out through the perspex. Now the rotor blades were still going and I can still see them and I think, oh God, I'm going to get cut in half with, a, with the rotor blade. Again, spirits, believe it or not, but I was taken then and just laid on the ground. That's what it seemed like. And I lay there and I thought, oh God, I'm smash my bloody um, machine up. That was my first thought. God, that's going to be a mark against my career. And I thought, oh, I'll just lie here for a bit and then I'll get up and see how Mac is. And I went to get up and there was no one at home to get up. I just couldn't move. And I thought, oh, God, i have broken my back. Meanwhile, Judy and Mark are just starting out. Youngsters, only 18 and 19. Mark is a shooter on the choppers and Judy working for the Ministry of Works at Haast. But it doesn't take long for reality to meet them head on. I can remember Johnny's wife, particularly at the time, who had two young children. There wasn't too many other people that were that had young kids when I first went down there. And, um, you know, she, she used to be quite nervous and worried all the time. And I thought, oh, I hope it never gets to that. And I worked during the day and the only thing that I wished for, and actually most of the time came true, was that I wasn't the one at home sitting and waiting and worrying. Um, and the first few incidents that Mark had, which were actually more than incidents, was the, the deed had been done, so to speak, the weren't out looking for him. It was, oh, this has happened, but everyone's okay. So, so the stir was taken me out of it. It wasn't till later on when I didn't know whether he was okay or not that I really realised that, oh, what's going to happen here? I didn't feel um, the need to spend hours of energy worrying about stuff that I believed was out of my control. It just didn't seem the point. I recall going to a period where we went to a lot of funerals and we had really young people and um, really sad funerals. And, you know, Mark was, was committed to it at this time and he was having a ball. But I think the one that really, really shocked me, I think the one that really shocked me was Bob Norton because this was somebody that was living in a house and it could have been anyone other that didn't come home that night. And he had a family, I think he had four kids. And um, I'm thinking, oh, this is actually really real. It does happen to people I truly know. This is getting a wee bit closer. And I don't recall changing any of our behaviour at the time, but I recall thinking, this is actually real. This does happen to people that are really, you know, in the house that I live in. We never actually sat down and said, this is a very dangerous industry. Where is this going to take us? I think we were still just caught up in the hype and the fun of it. It was an outdoor job and what you were in an awesome place and what else could you ask for? And Mac was able to come around and, and he put covers on me. Without him, I would have died. Back to Dave Richardson and his shooter, Alan McDonald. Dave is in a lot of trouble, thrown from the chopper and suffering a broken back. Mac 
is in a bad way too. He had spinal injuries as well and he had a broken leg. Oh, I had spleen was damaged. But it will be 50 hours until rescuers come. I kept yelling out to him. He went behind and got a deer blanket over him. And I kept on yelling out. And I asked him the time and he gave me the time. And it was about six and a quarter hours. And he never answered. Mac was dead. He was only 25. Yeah, and you just, you just went over in your mind, was it all worth it then? You know, was it worth it? Here you are, you had your accident. It doesn't going to happen to you, but it has. So, um, yeah, it was pretty hard. Yeah, it was just a nightmare. Judy and Mark are enjoying their life in Haast. They've got two children, are loving parents, but things are about to change dramatically. I was at home, I was nine months pregnant, I already had two children. And it was that, oh, this is late. All the power's gone out. Aren't those guys supposed to be back? Oh, somebody must have ran into a, a lamppost or something. But it was pretty quickly after that that Somebody rang up. Said, didn't you know, a helicopter had gone down. And one guy's alive and one's dead because I've heard shots. And so for about five or six hours, perhaps, I was wondering which one it was. So we didn't know. Um, so for quite a long period of time, I was in that, I was in that zone of shock, probably. And I understand that people didn't want to say too much at the time because I was nine months pregnant. The pilot's wife was nine months pregnant, so you couldn't have asked for a worse scenario ever. And there was limited information. They just didn't know, so it took a while to find them and took a while for that bit of news to come out. So, yeah, not a very pleasant time at all, really, sitting and waiting. You knew that somebody had been really badly hurt or was dead, but there was somebody alive. If you haven't got luck on your side, you might as well give it away. I've met Dave Richardson several times, and he's always very chipper and harbours no regrets. I was able to walk in crutches and I went back flying again. The civilization didn't like it very much. They wished me all the best and anything else but flying, you know. And they said, you can't egress the chopper and get in and out quick enough. So uh, I said, well, what's your criteria? They never had a criteria, so they had to allow me to go. Not only does Dave go back to flying, but he's lost none of his sense of fun. Down on the south coast, you catch deer out on the seashore. And my shooter and I always had a bit of a game with ourselves. Uh, he said, I bet you can't get this one. And I'd, I'd try and get the deer with the helicopter and not with the net gun. And I'd go along and I'd give it a boot with, my, with the skid and turn it over. And of course, I had to pull up, put my skid on it to try and catch it. And he said, oh, you won't do that again. And I think I did it six times. It really pushed your flying abilities, and, um, yeah, I loved it. Dave's in a wheelchair now, leading a very full life. He's not the only one to suffer this type of injury. He says he's lucky to still be here to remember the good times. Judy, nine months pregnant with her third child, waits for five or six anxious hours until she gets the news that Mark's alive. Instead, it's her friend, also nine months pregnant, whose husband has been killed. I didn't see Mark. He was taken directly up to Greymouth. They had to pack two children up, of course, and get up to Greymouth. And recall walking into the hospital and seeing this guy lying on the bed 
Um, of course, I didn't know what his injuries were, but he'd broken his pelvis and he'd just been fractured every bone in his face. I didn't know who he was. I seriously didn't even recognise him. Within 10 days, the day that he came out of hospital, I actually went into labour. I had that child in six minutes. We had to go to the back door of the hospital. Mark, first day at a hospital, could barely walk. He still wasn't recognisable. We come to the hospital door and he's all battered and bruised and I don't think they really wanted to open it. I do recall the very next day that they apologised to him when they realised that he'd been in an accident. I'm pretty sure they thought he'd been out brawling the night away, but his face still 10 days after was quite shocking to look at, scaring people on the streets. It's no wonder that after such stresses and strains, cracks begin to appear in their relationship. It would be odd if they didn't, given the circumstances. Looking back, I mean, we were really, really still quite young with three children. And um, again, people don't deal with stuff and they don't talk about it. There was no help. I remember us um, trying to go and get help and it was in grey mouths. We just, we just boxed on. We had three children and a mortgage and we just tried to make the best of it. And, and we just didn't deal with it. We didn't talk about too much of it and we just didn't deal with it in the right way. So, so things were bottled up. The last accident, you look back and it, it had a severe effect on both of us and we didn't deal with it in the way that we probably could have and there was no help offered. Um, so definitely a cumulative effect, you know, all this stuff. Mark was losing all, you know, heaps of mates all around him and he continued to do it. Um, and I put, you know, there was pressure on him in terms of looking, you know, being a dad. And my belief was that one person doesn't have a baby, two people have a baby and Mark was an excellent dad. And you know, my mum would say if Mark could breastfeed, he would have. Seriously, he was that good of a dad. But what we didn't deal with was the trauma that was having on him. And because Mark just boxed on and did it, I thought, oh, he's okay. And I guess ultimately he wasn't okay. He just needed some help. We both needed some help. So definitely, if you're asking me, did that have an effect on us separating eventually? Of course it did. So with all this going on, what made the game so irresistible? The answer, as usual, is money. Driving this boom are businesses, the so-called Queen Street farmers, people like bankers, lawyers, doctors, who get tax relief from buying deer. The demand for deer is insatiable. Many I've talked to say it was unsustainable and driven on all sides by greed. Seven seventy-five, friend. Seven seventy-five, bid. Seven seventy-five. Seven hundred and seventy-five. And on the market, I go. I'm going to sell for the one of another bid. Seven seventy-five, bid. Thank you, sir. The glass is on the corner. Seven hundred and seventy-five dollars. A lot of business people, particularly professional people that, that obviously make too much money, decided to get into deer farming and was one way of softening up their taxation blow. Dick Deeker, our friend with the hot water bottle who moved on to fly choppers, hung in there through thick and thin. Everybody wanted deer. They'd buy them off the hill from me. Like they want to buy them straight away. Yeah, I want a hundred deer, you know. And tell them, well, it's going to take me a long time to get a hundred deer, you know, only get two or three or four some days. Of course, as a result, there was big demand. The prices went up and up and up. There was one guy who used to turn up with his checkbook and he said, how many deer you get this morning? Oh, we got four. The guy said, oh, yeah, good looking deer. Oh, boy, they so He writes a check out for $10,000. And Jeff's down there taking them out of the nets and the bags to put them in our deer yard. These deer are all standing there sort of looking around and that. And the guy's got his trailer there and he said, oh, going back the trailer up. All of a sudden, one of them started getting the wobbles. We've got the wobbles, and uh, next thing it collapsed on the ground. Well, unbeknown to us, it had had a heart attack. But when it collapsed on the ground, Jeff Carter, he said, oh, it'll be all right, it'll be all right. Just a bit stressed out. So Jeff gets down and gives it mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. And that's a true story. Jeff and Dick have worked out of Te Anau for many years and are bloody good at what they do and they are still together at the time of the skyrocketing deer prices, 
as good hinds off the hill are fetching between three and five thousand dollars. Often the crews, pilots and shooters, take some of their catch in lieu of pay to set up their own farms. And of course at this stage, everyone's thinking that the good times will just roll on. Everyone likes the price rise, and that's what happened with the deer. It went from $70 up to 3000 In some cases up to five. I believe. It depends where you were, what sort of deer it was. I think Dick only settled for about 2900 to 3000 It was very good money, especially if you went and got half a dozen for a day. Sometimes you get ten. Uh, it was good money. You can make 10000 a week in those days. I used to take a lot of my pay in deer instead of being paid in cash or in money. I thought, we're at two Bob millionaires. You know, he thought this is going to last forever. But nothing ever lasts forever. Nothing. Jeff Carter is right. But most deer farmers, so caught up in the modern gold rush, they ignored the signs. I didn't really get any specific whispers, but we suspected it. I remember Tim Wallace saying at an auction one day, he said, Kevin's going to step in here, Kevin's going to get a step in here, because they're going for about four or $5,000 each. And it was all written off against it. Tax, and I remember Tim Wallace saying, I can remember him distinctly saying to me that this is not going to last, this is not going to last, the government's going to step in here. I always remember that, and I did sell a lot of them, and I got me fine with it. Tim Wallace, as usual, is ahead of the eight ball and right on the money. On the 26th of July, 1985, the good times come to an abrupt end with no warning. Finance Minister Roger Douglas introduces a standard deer price and a reversal of tax write-offs to take effect immediately. Predictably, the Queen Street farmers vanish overnight and their money with them. But the bill has an immediate and catastrophic impact on the deer industry. I had a friend from Wellington ring me. Dave Richardson. And he said, David, the deer industry is going to crash. I know what's coming. He said, get out of it now. So we did our sums and we were well over a million dollars with everything then. I thought, well, what are we gonna do if we sell all this, you know? Shall we sell it? You kick yourself because you were told. You know, I was told by this chap in Wellington. You know, he was the friend. And he said, Dave, I've given you two weeks to get out of the farm, sell it, put it on the market and get your million dollars or whatever you can get for it. And then we didn't. How many deer did you have on stock at your place when that crash came, Dave? Oh, I really don't know. We didn't get much more than about 400 on the farm. That's a hell of a lot. Oh, oh, yeah. What 400 was worth at, the, at, the, at its prime, and then like a week or two weeks later, what it was. Well, it went from, you know, this high price, it went down to $700, then went down to $250, if you could get it. No one wanted them because the carpet had been pulled out of the Queen Street Farmer. It was gone, finished. Because of the big money being paid out, Paul, you know, there was big money owing. The snowball never kept going. It was very wrong. It should have been set out that this is going to happen so that people could get their affairs in order and know where we're going to go in a certain time. Dave's story and experience is only one of many. People's properties, their savings, their helicopters, their jobs and businesses disappear overnight. Harvey Hutton is one caught up in the crash. Bought some lead, Wallaker, and set it up as a deer farm. But all the eggs were in basket. Because it was deer farming. And when, the, when Roger Douglas brought out the livestock tax, the deer went from being worth $2,400 down to five or six hundred dollars in Latin months. So it, your wealth just went down. Um, they end up selling the farm, they end up selling the helicopter because um, my debt was too high to service. And, and um, every time we got the debt down, they kept up on the interest rate. Patsy is with me today, when she got with me, I had a black overnight bag and a, and a Ford Courier truck. <laughs> that was because the, all the prices went up so quick, and then, but they come down just as quick that we, um, we uh, probably weren't ready for it. You, you've been resilient though, Harvey. I mean, a lot of people after that, 
livestock tax when they were crushed, that would have been the end of them. They would have had to just fold and move on. Also, I wasn't, I wasn't too, like I lost my father there, but I was young enough to start again. The effects go far beyond just physical assets. Harvey may have lost the shirt off his back, but it was even worse for others. Well, well when did you get your, your chopper? How did you go about doing that? Did you do it by yourself or did someone? No, no, I didn't by myself. I think the first one cost me about 130000 plus a license, which wasn't a hell of a lot of money. Jim Quirk, who almost blew his foot off with the weight from a deer net, eventually bought his own helicopter and set about building up a deer farm, as so many pilots and shooters did. I ended up buying a 300 as well as a 500. And I had Steve and Chris Podjewski flying one each. Well, I had half a million dollars with a deer freehold in the paddock, and a week later they were worth 10 grand, so I mean, yeah, it did have a huge effect. The same time, I had a couple of syndicates looking at buying deer and deer farming on their behalf, you know, looking at other properties, etc. cetera. And I remember going out and buying these deer, setting the syndicate they had almost signed up on it. I think it was about 200,000 bucks worth of deer, and then the whole thing went flat on its face. So I ended up with all these bloody deer, and uh, they were worth nothing. Because a lot of us came from Muldoon, I mean, he was the one that said, you know, get out and diversify, you know, and we'll give you bloody advantages to get these new types of farming off the ground, you know. I mean, it was a pretty sad event. A lot of people lost their ass, you know, and you know, a few suicides, quite a few. We weren't, weren't happy people, you know, what we call the failed experiment. I just couldn't see how the government would want to end. We knew they would change some things, but we didn't think they'd go as far as they did. And I thought, well, if they left it to the market forces, it would eventually force the prices down anyway. But it was just the industry was so short of stock at the time was one of the reasons that the prices were inflated. I mean, there were a few town investors or syndicates involved, but most of the guys in it were just ordinary buddy farmers, you know. Yeah, I just couldn't believe I thought, okay, make some changes. What if, even if the price fell in half, but didn't it just like they just fell from like two and a half, three grand to like two or three hundred dollars overnight? I mean, it was just unsustainable. They could have looked at the tax issue and said, oh, look, we're going to reduce it at so much a year, rather just completely bloody blanket change the whole thing, you know, so everybody had to rewrite the book. Some of those guys just couldn't see light at the end of the tunnel. They just couldn't fight their way through it. There was one in Tamanui where the father committed suicide, men by a wall out of the sun. Well, that's an indictment, isn't it, really, on the bureaucracy. And there are many others caught up in the change of rules. It's a bitter pill to swallow. Some go bankrupt, the lucky ones downsize and survive. Others leave to work overseas, but the Wild West days are well and truly over. It's the end of an era, an era we will never see the like of again. But Harvey's still in the air, these days for tourists and hunters and people like me, who are his bread and butter. Of course, the deer are still here, from the Kaimai Ranges in the Bay of Plenty to Raki Ura, Stewart Island, and most wild places in between. I still see them when I'm out tramping, not far from my home in Wanaka. But it's a lot fewer than the millions estimated in the 1930s, back when the deer wars began. We're just heading back to Harvey's hangar in Makarora when we spot them. It's a bit hard to hear there on the audio, but it's a mob of red deer on the side of the mountain, 30 or 40 of them, all running away as soon as they hear us. Helicopters mean danger. The chopper gives a twitch, and Harvey instantly switches to hunter mode. You can feel the intensity and excitement radiate to the cabin as he pursues the deer just meters above them. How lucky for them we are not hunters. Oh, you push it, you push the button, you push it, you push it, you push it.
Nokia farms continue today, but there's no more live capture, and farms now generate enough deer of their own to supply the market. At the time of making this podcast, in 2023, choppers are still shooting for venison under license to keep the numbers down, but on a pretty limited scale. So by the mid-90s, the war on deer was effectively over and largely forgotten. But for me, look, I've been making documentaries for 40 years, but this story grabbed me like no other. Simply because it was unique and the characters larger than life. And even after all the deaths, accidents and stress involved, Almost nobody seems to regret their time in the industry. For better or worse, it brought out the best in the Kiwi give-it-a-go mentality, and there will simply never be a time like this again. If today's aviation and government regulations existed then, the industry would never have got off the ground, and some of the characters would have been locked up. But for the job at hand, they were the right people in the right place, at the right time. Before I go, I would like to thank all those men and women who generously shared their stories. Not all made it into the podcast, and a number have died since I talked to them over the last 17 years. Our chats brought back those exciting and sad times, and it was not always easy for them but their honesty and generosity in sharing their stories has kept alive the memory of those stirring days when young men like Jock Fisher, Fred Dixon and others were sent into the hills with old rifles and not enough food and told to bring back the tales. Deer Wars is written and presented by me, Paul Roy. It's engineered by Alex Harmer. The executive producers are Katie Gossett, Justin Gregory and Tim Watkins.